We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings from Tbilisi, Georgia. This is Byrne, the Anadromist. And before we get going here, I might just point out, if you hear any children squealing in the background or cats on the roof or other random sounds, um, it's not random, it's Georgia. And uh, it's awfully hard to get away from people here. So I'm just recording. There's a thin window between me and everything else. So such is life. So what am I here to do? Well, I've been doing a series on how we got to where we are now. And I've discussed, uh, you know, the different historical roots for our current crisis of polarization and propaganda. Hopefully, by doing so, we'll be able to get some sort of sense of how we can find a way to uh, restore some sense of sanity to these times. Uh, I certainly can't do it myself, uh, nor can you just watching a video, but it, it helps to do anything. You have to have a sense of, of history and how we got here. And history happens in time. And time is one of the most important things that I have come to realize in my life. So what I'm going to do now, I have many subjects that I've wanted to cover besides this how we got to where we are uh, line of thinking. Each of these how we got here videos takes actually quite a while to make because I like putting lots of video examples and audio and images and all that takes time to edit lots more time than I thought it would. So meanwhile, uh, there are other things that I have uh, on my mind that I'd like to kind of unravel one of the things that I have noticed as I've uh, wandered around uh, YouTube and other sites is that there has been more of a discussion of meaning. Uh, what do things mean? Is there meaning? Um, you know, whether it's been Jordan Peterson's uh, work and the attacks upon it, or his discussions with other people like Sam Harris or uh, Slavoj Žižek, or whether it's been... Uh, through someone like Paul Vanderclay's discussions with John Verveke. Uh There's been a dis and, and and I'm to my great uh, pleasure, names like Owen Barfield have been getting thrown into the mix, which I find tremendously important because I've been reading Owen Barfield since the 1980s. So, one of the things I thought I would talk about is time and why time is so important, and what I mean when I talk about time. Before we start, I want to give you kind of a disclaimer. I am not a scientist. I am not a philosopher. I am not an academic. I am, when it comes to this kind of subject, just a layman. Uh, however, I have been thinking about these subjects since the, about 1993, well, specifically 1993. And there's a reason I say specifically, because it has to do with memory as well as time. Uh, there, I, there was a very definite moment when my vision turned to the meaning of time. And that's what I'm going to discuss today by way of introduction to the subject. In further uh, discussions, I will bore more intensely into the subject. I actually found my notes on time. I also have been thinking about the subject of evil and how evil relates to time. Love relates to time. In fact, everything that's not in the category of space relates to time, and that includes our living. So time is actually a huge subject, but we'll discuss what it is as we go along a little bit further today. But what I thought I would do, um, before we go too far here, is start off with a reading from 
Andrei Tarkovsky's amazing book, Sculpting in Time. Now, Andrei Tarkovsky is, or was, he died in the 1980s, a Russian filmmaker. Uh, he is, without a doubt, my favorite uh, filmmaker of all time. His films are slow. Uh, they explore landscape. They explore reality is what they do. Uh, I would say Andrei Tarkovsky is to cinema what Dostoevsky is to literature. Uh, these people who continually open it up and open it up and explore the meanings within. Now, Tarkovsky's films uh, include things like Andrei Rublev, Stalker, my absolute favorite, Nostalgia, uh, The Mirror, which is many people's favorite for poetic reasons, uh, Solaris, and, and a few other films. He, he only made seven real films in his lifetime, eight if you count his student film. But I noticed in his films some interesting principle at work, and that attracted me to him. I believe it was shortly after his death, a book came out, Sculpting in Time. And I consider Sculpting in Time to be the great book about art in the 20th century. It's not a survey of art. It's about art. Um, and it's also about, as the title tells you, time. He talks about his filmmaking process, but it's his chapters on art and time that are so important in that book. And he has one chapter called In Printed Time. And what I'm going to do right now is uh, read you from In Printed Time and maybe show you a little bit from one of his films. We'll, we'll choose Stalker. And then I'm going to tell you how the subject of time became so important to me and hopefully convince you to come back and find out why the subject of time should be crucial to you. So, Andrzej Tarkovsky. система ловушек, что ли. Но стоит тут появиться людям, как все здесь приходит в движение. Здесь исполнится ваше самое заветное желание. Самое выстроенное. Time is a condition for the existence of our I. It is like a kind of culture medium that is destroyed when it is no longer needed, once the links are severed between the individual personality and the conditions of existence. What is known as the moment of death is also the death of individual time. The life of a human being becomes inaccessible to the feelings of those remaining alive, dead for those around him. Time is necessary to man so that, made flesh, he may be able to realize himself as a personality. 
But I am not thinking of linear time, meaning the possibility of getting something done, performing some action. The action is a result, and what I am considering is the cause which makes man incarnate in a moral sense. History is still not time, nor is evolution. They are both consequences. Time is a state, the flame in which there lives the salamander of the human soul. Time and memory merge into each other. They are like two sides of a metal. It is obvious enough that without time, memory cannot exist either. But memory is something so complex that no list of all of its attributes could define the totality of the impressions through which it affects us. Memory is a spiritual concept. For instance, if somebody tells us of his impressions of childhood, we can say with certainty that we shall have enough material in our hands to form a complete picture of that person. Bereft of memory, a person becomes the prisoner of an illusory existence. Falling out of time, he is unable to seize his own link with the outside world. In other words, he is doomed to madness. As a moral being, man is endowed with memory, which sows in him a sense of dissatisfaction. It makes us vulnerable, subject to pain. Andrei Tarkovsky, Sculpting in Time, from the chapter Imprinted Time. I had read Tarkovsky's Sculpting in Time. Uh, it, I devoured it when it first came out, and I've been re rereading it ever since then. And his thoughts on time were very interesting to me. They were not the catalyst to click off my own thoughts on time. They were just uh, in the landscape. There were actually many other authors who had mentioned something to do with time as well, whether it was Michael Polanyi or... Um, you know, Paul Virilio, who I'm, I discovered a bit later in the 90s. Uh, and, and there were other writers. Uh, one could go on and on listing writers that I've read that mention something to do with time. But when, uh, in the early 90s, I was kind of going through a crisis in my life. And trying to understand things. I had had, I was in New York City at that time. I'd been in 1993, I'd been there 13 years, almost 13 years, about 12, 12 and a half years, we'll say. And as I was there, I had gone through many experiences, met many people, had different kinds of relationships with people. And something happened in the early 90s that made me start wondering, for instance, you start wondering, why do you repeat things over and over? Why are your relationships with people similar? Why can't you get out of certain traps in your relationships with individuals? And of course, these relate to love, and they relate to family, and they relate to uh, business and work, the things we do and or seek to do. Uh, or seek to avoid, over and over and over. And so I started thinking about my past. Uh, one thing that was interesting is between the years 1980 and the, uh, from about, uh, we'll say, October of 1980 until 1993, I did not take any photographs in New York City. There's a very specific reason for this. I didn't take any photographs. One was when I first got to New York City, I read Susan Sontag's book on photography. Then I also read Roland Barthes' book, uh, Camera Lucida. Both of them convinced me that something, there was some kind of fakery going on with photography. And of course, the more we have our digital cameras now and can take endless photographs, the more that fakery becomes so clear, especially when you see people's selfies. And having worked in the tourist business, I can tell you I've observed people who go around the world 
and take pictures of themselves in front of things and never see the things themselves, which is quite frightening. It is very difficult to take photos of something like a mountain or a statue or a cat and make it interesting. And you may think otherwise, but let's see your photos. Let's see if they are worth looking at more than once. Um, but I did take photos when I was in my teen years and, uh, and late teens, early twenties. And I took photos of a very specific period in my life. It was when I first became a Christian through this kind of wild and woolly Jesus people movement and time on these communes. And as I was looking back at the past, I began to realize that it was very important for me to see those faces still. Had I not taken those photos, I wouldn't have them to look at anymore. And so I suddenly saw, it wasn't that Sontag or Barthes had convinced me through their writing that I shouldn't take photographs. That was just a personal decision on my part. But I was, in a sense, trying to think about the nature of photography. And I did take a couple of photos of myself in a photo booth to send pictures to my mother. Oh, I did that a couple of times in those 13 years. But I looked at the photos, particularly of this one uh, of when I was living on these farm communes, and I thought to myself, this is really interesting. These photos are good because they capture a moment in the past, which in many ways uh, no one else was capturing. And not that they're great photos, but they just simply captured the life in some way that was memorable. And so I looked around at where I was in New York, and I think where I was in New York at that moment, there were a lot of really memorable people in my life. And so I thought to myself, you know, I need to go and capture them. So whether they were artists or punk rockers or uh, nascent filmmakers, I needed to capture some of the faces of the people that I knew. And I am so glad that I did, looking back on it. But I realized that photography would work for me on one level if I captured the people as I saw them. That is to say, not as they presented themselves necessarily, although sometimes you get those shots. I didn't want smiling faces of people. Those really don't tell you much about people because it's a mask. Smiles and photos are nearly always a mask. To get a genuine smile from someone is a tough thing to do. But I was, I realized the importance of those photos. I was also thinking about, I would look through my one high school yearbook and I would look at those things and say like, my, how things have changed. My, how that time changed me. My, look at those faces, most of whom I never see anymore. But yet, one of them in particular, whom I never really talked to, had a great effect upon me. There was a girl who used to sit around on the school, and she seemed like kind of an intelligent uh, artist type, uh, a rebel outcast, uh, and I could only dream of being that kind of person because I was much more of an outcast than that. I was pretty much a loner, uh, didn't have many friends. And, uh, and, and in a sense, she was a stone that I tripped on, which then led me to uh, eventually when I met the Jesus people shortly thereafter in 1970, I saw something similar in them. They were kind of these interesting, creative outcasts in a certain way. They were not like the religious right, quote unquote. Uh, they were not uh, they were not predictable people by any means. They were a lot of them were hippies who had become Christians. And the funny thing about that was uh, they would drag me around as the one person who never took drugs to say, "See, you don't need to take drugs to be a Christian." <laughs> so anyway, that's a long story. We're not even going to begin to get into. But I started thinking more and more about the past and how the things of the past shape who you are now. And I started thinking about memory. Um, and I started thinking about how uh, our memories, often they're there, whether you think they're there or not. Um, now, I had been off and on, and it's always off and on, keeping some sort of written journal uh, ever since I was about 16 years old. 
And at this point, it's probably, oh, it goes outside the frames of this, uh, of this video. Let's say it's, uh, two meters long worth of books of stuff I've written down. Is it worth reading? Eh, a lot of it probably isn't. Some of it might be. Um, it also includes uh, books I've tried to write and things like that. But I think that I had always kind of thought there was some reason to writing things down and for remembering them. I was always, after a certain point in my childhood, I got extremely interested in history. And I came to realize that history was essentially an act of memory. I also started to realize that your memories could be really affected or infected by the way you put them into your memory. So if you had a memory of someone uh, and you were inclined to say that person was always bad and this person criticized you for some reason, and then you said, how dare they criticize me? Then you would put that memory in inside of yourself as something that's just like, Ugh, I don't want to think about that. It's still there but you wouldn't want to think about it. And you, nor would you see what they were actually on some poor level trying to communicate to you. But I realized that there was a value in trying to put things in. No one can put anything into your memory, you know, untainted. It's always tainted. But to put it in as honestly as possible. And to realize there are things in your memory you really don't want to face and things in your memory you really should face. So I kind of came up with this idea of going back into my memory, not to be obsessed with my past, but to understand who I was, how I got here, why I kept making the same mistakes, to open up those closet doors, to open up those drawers within the closets and let them stay open to get some air and not to be afraid of the things in my past. To this day, I have a rule. I don't walk around blabbing about my past to anyone who comes. But if I was to get into a conversation with someone and it were to take a turn and that turn moved to a very dark place in my past or a very difficult thing to discuss, I'm still there. So if someone wants to discuss the death of my mother, my question for you is, are you ready? Because I've got some intense stuff to tell you. If someone wants to discuss, you know, some of my failures in life, uh, my sins, I'm ready to go. I'm also willing to discuss things that I think maybe I've done right. But of course, everyone's willing to do that, aren't we? So, it was around that time in 1993. It was in the spring. Now, I don't have my journal, so I can't check my time, but I'm just remembering where the sun was. I'm remembering... It was about May of 1993. Now, here's the thing. I can access my memory. I could, if I wanted to right now, get almost completely specific about the date because more and more information would come to me the more I probed my memory. And one thing I've learned over the years is how to make your memory really work. Now, I have no interest whatsoever in being one of those very, very silly people who uh, gives courses on you know, how to make your memory work or something like that. That doesn't work. It's just, it's how you connect to life. You know, I can give you a few pointers, but the main thing is it's already there. Your memory is working. Even people who say their memories don't really work that well. Ha. Huh. And funny, funny thing enough, I mean, I've been around Alzheimer's patients. You know what? They may not be able to tell you what they ate for breakfast, but they can sing you songs from 60 years earlier. That's kind of interesting. But anyway, we won't discuss those things right now. But as it was around May 1993 that I took a trip back to California. Now, there were reasons, which I won't go into, for my trip back to visit my uh, mother and stepfather. But that while I was there, I decided to do something else. I decided to drive to different places that meant something to me. Because I'd been working with my memory and I thought, well, let's go look. Let's go look at the trees that show up in my first dream outside of uh, the elementary school 
uh, one, one of my first dreams that I can remember. Let's go look at the cemetery in the back of uh, the valley, in Sun Valley in San Rafael, California, uh, the Mount Tamalpais Cemetery. Let's go look at the place where I used to hunt lizards, and let's think about that. And I thought, let's go to the junior high school, which seems like such a traumatic place to me. Or it did, but it doesn't so much anymore. Uh, let's, let's drive around to the places that were very important to me and go up to the, uh, the rock quarry, which discovering it was like discovering the Grand Canyon, the way it opened up on the side of this hill. Let's go to, um, well, let's go to high school. Let's go sit back and watch where that girl used to sit. Let's walk around. Let's think about the people we used to know. And you know, I was sitting there and I sat exactly in the spot where she used to sit uh, uh, during her lunch times. And I looked around me and I thought, this is very strange. I, in a sense, have become that intelligent, creative person that I saw in her that I wished I could be. How very strange. Did she remain that way? Evidence, not so much. But that's, a, that's not okay. I wish you would have. But for me, it was very important. So I decided at, at that moment, I just had, it was just like I realized it was a very powerful moment. It brought tears to my eyes to realize what my life had become and how different things that happened had brought me to this point where I could sit here and reflect back on it and how fortunate I was to be able to do that. Instead of becoming the loser that I kind of felt like I was when I was, say, 14 years old. Now, I also felt there was something else scratching at the back of my mind. But I know something. When that thing is there and you know something else is there, don't try to get it. It'll come to you. It'll come. And boy, did it come. And so I returned to New York City. And when I returned to New York, I uh, remember exactly there were two things that happened. One was that there was a girl I knew who wanted to get breast reduction surgery. And I felt, and I wasn't alone, that this was really a, an act of self-loathing. Uh, her breasts were not obscenely large. Uh, they were, she was in fact quite beautiful. But she nevertheless, while I, was, I talked to someone and they said, yeah, she went to get her, her well, actually I talked to her, she'd come back and said, yeah, I had my breasts done. And I just felt so sad about that. And the truth is, later, I had really good reason to be sad about that. Within about two weeks of that moment, uh, she hung herself in someone's bathroom. So, sadly, I was exactly right about self-loathing. And I had told her, but it didn't matter. She had gone and done that. But anyway, before I'd found out about the suicide, the second thing was, I used to buy and sell record collections and sell them out of a small independent record store in Soho called Rocks in Your Head. And there was this Jamaican guy uh, who used to come in, Jamaican-American, used to come in and sell me records, which I, he seemed like he needed the money, so I would help him out. He, he was friendly, too. We would talk, and we had a good time. So, you know, I felt like, okay, maybe I can help him out by buying records from him now and then. And I'm walking down the street, and he sees me, and he comes up to me and says, hey, I've got some records to sell you. And I said, great, let's see them. And I looked at them, and I said, well, you know, I, it seems like I have most of these records. So, uh, thanks, but, uh, you know, not these. I went to the record store where my records have been sold. First time I had been there since uh, I got back from my trip to California. And this uh, one of the workers, one of my friends there said, uh, Hey, I hate to break the news to you, but about 50 of your records, uh, more like 30 of your records were stolen. And then I thought about it. I said, the guy was actually trying to sell me the records he had stole from me back to me. 
It was just absolutely incredible that anyone would do that. And I'm walking down the street. I remember it was on 12th Street in New York City, a place where not only did so many things in my life happen that were meaningful, but by the year 1995, I would actually be living on 12th Street. 12th Street is like uh, the sacred spot for me in New York where so much happened. But I'm walking down 12th Street. And of course, looking around, things just are ricocheting off my mind of things that have happened on this corner or in that store. And I'm thinking about these two people. The girl who gets her breast reduction surgery, even though it's obviously an act of self-loathing. And the guy who ruins a, a relationship with me in order to sell me my own records back to me. And thereby making it impossible for him to ever have a relationship with me again. Well, at least not without some confessions on his part and uh, some humility and forgiveness, which I would be willing to do if he actually showed signs of forgiveness. And as I thought about it, I said to myself, you know, it's almost as if these people don't live in time that they don't take the effects of time seriously. And then I stopped, and suddenly I realized it wasn't as if. It's that they didn't live in, the, in time. That is to say that they lived as if time had no effect, as if the past and present had no effect, as if... What happened yesterday and what happened tomorrow were two separate things. They only lived now, 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 now. Everything was a now, nothing was a then, nothing was coming tomorrow. And then the thing that hit me, hit me. It wasn't just them. It was, in fact, so much of this modern, postmodern world living as if time did not matter. It was as if, well, it wasn't as if. It was, in fact, that people's lives, so whether it's transportation, driving around in a car, well, that gets you places much faster, which is something happening in time. Uh, computers get you places much faster. You can go on the internet right now and contact someone in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, and you don't know anybody in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, but you can pretend you do. You can pretend, oh yeah, how's it going? You have no idea. You've just eliminated the all the effect of time of getting there and spending any time knowing anything about the culture or the language, and you think you know something because maybe the person speaks a bit of English. Um, that the effects of time are everywhere and that we spend so much of our time, whether by using the phone or by using even, you know, uh, when you watch a movie, something strange happens in time at that point. Now, it can be a good thing as in a Tarkovsky movie, or it can just be a vacuous, empty experience as in, I don't know, uh, some big budget Hollywood spectacle that everyone's supposed to talk about for five minutes and then disappear. And then I started thinking about more things about time. I started thinking about this. Well, what is time? You know, and, and I started realizing from Tarkovsky and from others I'd been reading that time is not just the clock going around. Uh, you know, that's one of the big misconceptions people have is that time is the clock. Time isn't the clock. Uh, Jonathan Peugeot recently put out a... Uh, a little discussion where he he said that time has become uh, disordered and is sped up. It isn't that time has become disordered. Time remains time. It's that we have become disordered with our experience of time. Time hasn't changed at all. Time is, and here's the point, time isn't the same for everyone. And this is where I started thinking about how time relates to science and how time relates, for instance, Many people think that if you take a slide of blood uh, of, uh, or if you get the DNA of something and you look at it, that you'll have a good picture of a, a cat 
or a good picture of what somebody's problems are inside of them. No, you don't. Any more than a still photograph shows you what a movie shows you. A slide is just a, a random sample of a second or a moment or something within a person, but it doesn't tell you much about the person any more than knowing that you are, you know, how many percent water, most of you is water, tells you anything about the fact that you're a human being. I mean, it tells you something. If you don't have enough water every day, you suffer for it. If you get too much, you suffer for it. If you're in a hot environment, you suffer. If you're in a cold environment, you suffer. Yeah, water does play a part, mostly when it's a problem. But not day-to-day -day life. You don't. Water doesn't tell you much about yourself at all. So, I mean, you can learn a little bit, but not that much. Not, you can't learn about your psychology through water. You can't learn about your history or your sociology through water. You can't learn about uh, even why, you know, you have a pain in your knee or why you you have a cough simply because of water. You have to know a lot more. Even if you know all the properties of H2 and O, you have to know a lot more to know about yourself. And I started thinking like, yeah. And then I saw it. Oh, in the past, when Galileo and Copernicus and uh, Van Leeuwenhoek were all getting fascinated with looking out at the world through telescopes and microscopes, they just kind of put time into a system of measurement. It became a measurement. Um, but it was not, they didn't take it into account. And I think the reason they didn't take it too much into account is because they didn't have a problem with it. They still lived essentially in a world of calendars. They didn't live in a world of clocks and schedules. So what's happened in science, what seems to have happened, is that science looked, started to weigh and measure everything. People fell in love with weighing and measuring. And then what eventually happens is that, well, you can't really weigh and measure God. So where does God go? And then once you decide God can be politely pushed out the door, well, what about uh, things like, uh, I don't know, love, joy, beauty, truth? What about those things? They're all kind of abstract. Uh, what do they mean? They can be pushed out the door. Um, well, we can push out other things. We can push out uh, personality. That's kind of a strange thing. Uh, we can push out our words. Now, right now, you're watching this on a video, which is a repeatable version of my words, just as a record is, or a, a tape recording, or a digital recording, or a movie would give you my words repeated. But that puts it into the category of space. Time is actually quite personal. Each of us experiences time completely differently from the others. Not only that, we experience it differently every day. So, uh, take three people on the same day. One person learns that their mother has just died. Another person is going through another humdrum day of work as a cashier at McDonald's. And the third person is has just fallen in love. Those pe people's experience of the next hour or 24 hours is going to be radically different. Because time isn't what the clock does. Time is what happens inside that. Time is personal. Each person's experience of time is differently. Each thing's experience of time is differently. Each atom's rotation in time is different. No two things are alike. And I think chaos theory now tells us that this is true. But I'm not going into all of that right now. All I can tell you is that I suddenly realized that science has to really go back and discover more about what time really is. Because you see, in the end, once you say all there is is what can be weighed and measured, everything goes out the door. And all you're left with in the end is mathematics, and I mean that. If you think there's anything else a, through weighing and measurement, you're, you're wrong. It's just mathematics, ultimately is the end. And mathematics is purely abstract. So then in the end, what's it about? Two apples and two apples equal four apples. But you know what? They don't 
equal four apples eternally. And what will happen if we come back in a year to those four apples? Well, maybe a bird will have eaten one. Maybe two of them will rot away, and one of them might start to grow. We have no idea, because there are so many variables. That's what chaos theory tells us. But the point is this. We have to go back and think about the meaning of time for our lives. And here is where the rubber meets the road. So you have human relationships. Say you fall in love. People these days hook up. What does that mean? <laughs> you know, are you on a chain? Are you hooking up like that? Are you on a fish hook? You hook up like that? Well, what's the hardest thing in relationships, particularly since the 1960s? It's been the commitment factor. People are willing to give their bodies away easily. But it's the commitment factor that's so problematic. It's defining it. What kind of relationship do we have? Oh, I don't know. Uh, let's not define it. Well, where's the, what's the definition? The def definition comes down to if we say it's anything serious, we then are committed to each other. And what's commitment? It's the time element. So we are not just images presenting to ourselves. We are human relationships. And finally, I thought about this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Time. The book of John says, in the beginning was the Word, Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what's the Word? What's Logos? Well, a Word implies a relationship. This is why the Trinity is such an interesting idea. It implies that God has never been static. It implies that nothing in the in in the entire universe is static. Everything is in relationship. And what are relationships? Something happening in time. Now, maybe I'm not using the best philosophical language to discuss these things. Maybe Heidegger did it better in his book. Uh, maybe other people have said it better. But here's what I know. As soon as you reduce everything to something instant, something uh, reproducible, something like that. If you think that's what life is, it's just something that could be weighed and measured, you're in deep trouble. But we'll leave it there for now. We'll come back in a week or two and continue. Uh, we'll get a little bit more in depth into the meaning of time. This has just been an introduction, and I wanted to relate to you how I discovered what time was to me, and that it is personal. And it's also how the memory connects to time, and it connects, connects very deeply. So one thing I'd like to say, besides thanks for listening and, and such, is thank you to the people who have started to subscribe. I've got a couple of people already on the uh, $10 a month plan, and they're getting, they've are getting already received their uh, about five hours worth of content that the rest of you, well, actually more than five hours, seven hours worth of content that the rest of you are not getting because they subscribe. So I need the help. Uh, please do subscribe. Please do contribute through PayPal. All I can tell you right now is jeepers, things have gotten uh, tight here in Georgia, and I could really use the help. So you can do that uh, by way of help. Meanwhile, though, if this is important to you, share it, spread it around. If it's uh, if I've said anything that you want to discuss more, write it down. If you have more questions, write them down. Uh, really, I appreciate the comments. And thank you so much for spending the time with me. And remember, the anadromous life is a life that swims against the stream. So do that. Not just to be some sort of rebel, but because the stream has taken us to some sort of waterfall. I don't know if we can survive as a, as a culture, as a world. So what we need is people who will think of different ways to do things and maybe find ways to divert the stream around the waterfall, like the locks at Niagara Falls. I don't know if that was a great analogy, but you get the point. Thanks for watching. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.